Hello, welcome to Trade Plates Live. The set looks slightly different today because we're actually in Coventry. Um, we're in Ian Cook's studio, you may have heard of him, Pop Band Colour, and I've also got Umesh Samani sat next to me from Specialist Cars Stoke. Um, if you want to let us know any questions, any topics you want to talk about, just get on the chat box below, let us know, or you can tweet us at Trade Plates TV, at James is manning all the tweets and all of the conversation, so just send them over. Um, first, we're going to kick off and just get a bit of background from Ian. Can you tell us a bit of your story? Um, so basically, uh, I'm an artist, obviously, mm. uh, but I paint solely using radio control cars, tyres and wheels. Mm. Um, I have been for eight years now. And I guess the big question is why? Why? Why not? Well, I think, uh, <laughs> I think paintbrushes are, are overrated. Um, not no, enough batteries. Well, it, it, it all started because my ex-girlfriend, she bought me a radio control car for Christmas. Right. And said to me, don't take that in studio and don't get paint on it. And oh, I okay. Thought, That's a good idea. <laughs> 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 it was like, well, uh, so yeah, I, I, it was Lightning McQueen from the film Cars. So I, I tried, I, did, I tried to work out how to paint. You know, do put a paint, a, a tub of paint on the top of it. Uh, do you paint each wheel? Like mm. how do you actually paint with a car? Right. To create something. Mm. Um, and I first of all started doing colour wheels and colour theory because mm. uh, I was teaching at that time. Um, and then I started the first image I did was Pudsey Bear for Children in Need, right. which I've done live on Breakfast Radio. So doing a visual thing on radio. Don't yeah, know how that worked, <laughs> but it worked. So, yeah, it did something. Um, and I started uh, doing it as an event. So my first event was at uh, the Heritage Motor Centre at Gaydon, which is mm. now the British Motor Museum. Um, and I, I did Land Rovers, because being from Solihull, Land Rovers, what we build yeah. and uh, whatever, you know, with the industry around here. And, um, and it kind of got a bit of momentum and... I started, you know, within that year, I then, I was down, went down to Goodwood, mm. I was spotted by uh, a PR company doing the stuff for, um, for Lewis Hamilton mm. um, and Reebok. So I then painted a giant portrait of Lewis Hamilton that year, which was the size of a three-straw building. Mm. Um, and that was where it all kind of snowballed, really. So this artwork was revealed in London next to Tower Bridge, uh, 15 metres by 8 metres, and wow. um, all done with the cars. Mm. And then he won the championship that year, which kind of helped a lot. Yeah. And then, yeah, from, from, so from there on, it, it just, you know, started creating for manufacturers, mm. you know, primarily manufacturers, but then I also do dealer, you know, create it live at dealer events and mm. I do workshops. And so this is like taking you all around the world, isn't it? And Fortunately enough, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I've been lucky and also, you know, just working at it to, to really, you know, be, be in interesting places. And what I get a buzz of is, creating live at events in yeah. front of people so they can kind of see it and believe it because it's, it's always one of those things that they, you need to see it to believe it so that's see actually done with cars and not with a brush. Mm. So it's got to be, hasn't it? Like you say, it's, you know, it's totally different. Nobody sort of does it. Yeah, so. no, no, I, I am the guy who paints with cars. and Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I enjoy. And I really enjoy it and I really enjoy the industry. And a lot of my friends are in the industry. Uh, and that's uh, it kind of like I have this, this kind of unique kind of creative jigsaw of me of, of of what I do really yeah and now I'm here at Fargo it's great to have my 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 own unit and shop and unit and man cave <laughs> <laughs> That's quite nice. uh, to do stuff like this you know to, to, to invite people up and mm. and see what is you know, co you know historically Coventry has always had uh, a a link with the car industry mm. and I think it's really important to to be in a place that has that that link as well yeah. as having a community of other people and yeah. cr other creatives here and yours, Umesh, you're not far away. Do you find that being in sort of a automotive-based area is good for your business? Or? I would say so, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just up the road, isn't it? You get an hour and a bit up the road, mm. so not too far at all. Yes, yeah. And so what have you seen in dealerships that does being, having you painting in a dealership sell cars is basically what? Um, I, I, it's difficult. I, I think the main thing I do with dealerships, I do dealer launch events. Yeah. So if they've got a new... If they, yeah, a lot of, re, over the last couple of years, a lot of um, dealerships have been rebranding. So if mm -hmm. they were, say it was a VW dealership and they had Skoda or you know, Seat with them, mm -hmm. they've, they've now got individual dealerships. So at one point they were all separating the dealerships. Yeah. So when the dealership was relaunching, I'd come and do that, that event. Yeah. So I, yeah, I've been all over the country doing different events, you know, creating obviously cars and you know, car artwork with the brand of car as mm -hmm. well. Um, so I, they are really interesting though, They're, those events are really interesting because they bring out kind of the classic stuff like you know, if you're a VW they bring out the classic VW, 
dub stuff yeah. or Audi, the classic Audi stuff, as well as having it alongside the new brand. Mm. But you kind of get a real idea of what you know dealers who you know the 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 relationship they have with their clients. Mm. And I'm sure that's you know, what you have is, is yes, a relationship. Yeah. So. Yeah. Right, so yeah, with you doing these sort of events at uh, car showrooms, it's something different to, to attract the audience mm. in. Mm. And that's all it is, you know, it's trying to get the, the audience to the showroom, isn't it really? Mm. So yeah, they might have a major rebrand, but it's something different they can see, which they're not going to see every day, are they really? So and then do, one, yeah. once, the art, one, once the event's done, they, are, they obviously get to keep, you know, if they're paying, yeah. you know, paying for it, they, they get to, to keep the artwork as well, and they have it as a you know as a thing on the wall to, to remember the launch event mm. um, as well. Which and as, the, you know, as you can see with the Jaguar behind, yeah. they're not small. They're not they're small pieces. Big. They're yeah. pretty pretty imposing pieces to have on a wall, and normally brightly coloured and quite you know mm. vibrant. So, and if you, anyone wants to see what Ian's been up to today, if you head over to Twitter, you can see he's been recreating the Trade Plates logo, which looks really cool. So go and have a look at that. Um, so, Umesh, I want to know what's going on with you at the moment. How are you finding April? April's very good. Yeah. Uh, the first quarter's been very good, and April's very good at the moment as well. Mm. So, so no complaints from me here. Yes. Yeah. How's yeah. the whole year been? Whole year's been very good. Yeah. Uh, last couple of years, to be honest, has been increased on on the last two three years. So overall business very good. Mm. Yeah. We've had a lot of people saying <coughs> about PCPs affecting independence. Are they damaging you, or is this something? I think the PCP market is. Uh, it's bursting into it at the moment. I think every yeah. manufacturer is throwing so much money at it. Uh, it is making a lot of sales. Yeah. But in reality, I think it depends on which used car dealers what they want to be into. I keep away from very late cars for that reason. Okay. So I'm making sure I don't get caught out with the PCP. You know, if, I, if you've got a lot of late model cars and the manufacturers with all the incentives, mm. you're going to find it difficult to compete. Yeah. For what, anyone that doesn't know, what sort of cars do you sell? Mainly prestige cars. Mm. Uh, Audis, BMWs, Mercedes, Volkswagen, that sort of stuff. Uh, my background is VW Audi before, so majority over the years have been Volkswagen Audi. I still right. love the product, so. And how long has your business been open? 18 years. Wow. And you went straight from working doing Volkswagen stuff into. That's your right, own yes. Business? Yeah, originally I used to be a mechanic. Right, okay. So a bit of background there. Yeah. Uh, motor vehicle technician, to be, to be exact, my title those days. Yeah. <laughs> I did seven years as a mechanic on Vauxhalls, went into selling. Uh, VW Audi, I did that for 15 years, mm. and then 18 years I thought, right, just make a move for myself, uh, and that's when I started on my own. Mm. Yeah. So what, when you're selling cars, what's your tactic? Tactics? Yeah. How uh, quickly can you sell a car? How quickly? I can sell cars 10, 15 minutes. Right. It, it <laughs> literally is, it. people don't believe that. I, th I think customers, when they come in to buy a car, they don't want it to be drawn out for hours and hours. Mm. I think it's very simple. Yeah, if you make it easy, simple for customers, that's what it's about. Mm. They come in, they know what they want, and if you're pleasant with them, you purchase all the car. Right. You know, I think a lot of dealers. I, th I think just go back to basics at the end of the day. I think a lot of dealers trying to put too many spins on it, mm. uh, and the feedback from many customers is they'll go to dealer, they'll see the salesman. The salesman's not authorized to give prices, for example, on cars or work the deal out. A wrong phrase but the puppets basically you know to go backwards and forwards mm. the customer just wants you know honest uh, deal to be put in front of them what they can do whatever but a lot of dealers will say right go to the salesman then they get passed on to the business manager then on to somebody else then on to somebody else mm. it's a very very drawn out process and I think customers just hate it uh, yeah. because it is a process yeah you know, I know, we, we I all know want things think, simple I, and easy, don't we? Yeah. yeah, I would. As soon as it took more than half an hour, I'd be like, I don't really know if I want this car anymore. This is too long. <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 So it's, I think it's just in reality, it's just making it easy for people. It's as simple mm. as that. Really, back to basics. Yeah. Th that's all I do. And where are people are people coming to your website to find the cars, or are they finding you through Auto Trader or elsewhere? Various platforms. Yes, mm. we've got Auto Trader, uh, who I'm with. Uh, a lot of dealers have jumped the ship on that. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a very hot potato that subject as uh, yeah, cause in I was motor trade. I know James Lugger said earlier this week on our forum that he's left auto trade now. It's the best thing he's ever done. But I don't know what you think about. Can anybody do that? Or I think you can. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, I think every business is different, and it depends what suits their business. I mean, obviously James decided to, to leave auto trader. He's doing other sorts of marketing, which mm -hmm. has not affected his business. He's doing great, yeah. and obviously saving the cost of auto trader. But it depends on what he's spending elsewhere. Uh, yeah. there's, there's quite a few other dealers, uh, Jim Reed for example, I mean he left Australia yeah. three years ago, 
it's not affected his business, <laughs> it's booming. Yeah. So I think every business is different. You, know, you, you can't say everybody jump the ship mm. or everybody stay on. I think each dealer has got to make their own mind up. Is it return on investment? Mm. As simple as that really. If it's not working, pull the plug and get out. Yeah. Uh, but they've got to look at, you know, what are the leads, what are the margins, and is it viable? What have you found that's really worked for you when it comes to selling cars? Is there anything on your website, online, that's really worked? Or anything that you've tried that hasn't worked and you've looked back and gone, oh, why have I done that? <laughs> I'll tell you what sells cars for me, and people still don't believe it, my videos. Right. 360 walk around videos mm. sell cars. Uh, the last time when I should have been uh, on Skype with you, yeah. <laughs> uh, I couldn't make it. The customer rang me uh, 11 o'clock the night before mm. because he's seen a video on my website. Right. Left a message to say he wanted the car, could I ring him back? Mm. It was 11 o'clock at night, I was in bed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> rang him back the next morning, which was Bank Holiday Monday. Uh, we just talked to him and said, I've seen the video, can I leave you with a deposit? I don't want to lose the car. Right. I said, yeah, no problem, took the details down. Came down on Tuesday from Western Superman, mm. looked at the car and he said, it's exactly what the video is, paid me the price. Wow. And I had the That's same thing good. literally two days ago, a guy rang me on a BMW uh, on the Friday, mm. he said, I don't want to lose the car, can I give you a deposit? Came on Saturday, bought it. So video sell cars. Because they can see exactly what? They can see you exactly, and I think that's, you've got to be transparent with the customers. Mm. I think there's too many dealers and I still can't understand why they have two or three pictures not showing the car. Mm. At the end of the day, that's the showroom. People don't want to drive from one dealer to the next. They want to see it online, iPad, yeah. whatever it is. And exactly what we're going to get. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know for you, social media, video, has been a matter as well as obviously you've done a lot of travelling <laughs> and shows to get your brand yeah, out there. I mean, but it's it's really so, I mean, the thing for me is that, you know, you're saying working out what the best way of marketing. You know, I mean, creating live at an event is what I. I wouldn't have a business without it. You know, there's mm. several different avenues. You've got to, for me, you know, you know, I've been on Twitter since 2008. So when it was very young as a brand, as a, as a brand. Mm. but I wanted to, I, it, was a, it was a comfortable network for me to, to feel I can engage and do stuff with. Yeah. Um, and then gradually Instagram, because you know, I'm an image maker, mm. that's what sells my artwork more than anything. You know, my highest network is that. Yeah. Um, not that I, Oh, you know, push more out on it or whatnot. It's just that that's what people mm. can see my artwork on first normally. Yeah. Um, and when you're at an event and there's you know, various hashtags or whatever, it's about you know joining that conversation, you know, you know, isn't it? A community of people, people being able to see what's going on. And whilst I'm painting, I will tweet photos of mm. of what I'm doing and yeah. and, and what, why I'm doing it or who I'm doing it for. And that's like you know, a lot of my clients. Well, that's what they want me to do is they, they, they want me to, to, to talk about what I'm doing when I'm doing it. That's what it's about, it's, it's the interaction isn't it, you know, it's not yeah. a case of that's the finished product, they want to see exactly what you're doing, how you're doing it. Yeah, so, and, yeah. And, and the evolution of any, yeah, any technology stuff is you know, being able to you know, par you know, live feed stuff, mm. video stuff, you know, any, any kind of network that you can create unique content on. Um, that's what I try and lend. You know, my business is constantly evolving with where I need to, to yeah. push it. And, and the what first I time do. you went to America, how did they hear about you then? Because that's yeah, that was quite good. that was good. So um, there's a company called um, Motor Track who right. look after a lot of dealer websites in the US. Right. So East Coast and West Coast, and they've got an East Coast office and West Coast office. So they actually uh, they got an artwork of mine through an auction, mm. uh, which is Ferrari 458, which I created at Goodwood. Um, and they had it got they've got it in their head office in uh, down south, mm. and um, so yeah, they approached me and said, "We we want you to do this event out in Vegas, which is which is for all the automotive dealers in the US go to Vegas once a year, mm. and they have all this you know big conference in the Bellagio, yeah. So like this huge glamorous that's hotel. got to be Nada, hasn't it?" Yes, yeah. It's JD Power. Oh, right. Yeah, the JDPAAMR. Yes. So, yeah. I don't remember it. I was like, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, I remember the hashtag more. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, so that was the, 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 the main you know, reason to, to, to go out there. Mm. And obviously, being out to America, I hadn't been to America and I've always wanted to do it. So, um, to do it once and then do it again was, was ace. Yeah, it yeah. was really cool. And to do my, like last year, we, we went to Auto Nation, which is a massive dealership, uh, their dealership network on the East Coast. Right. Um, so we'd created their head office in, um, 
uh, in Fort Lauderdale. So they're wow. 15th floor of this, this, this building. You literally look over the entire of Fort Lauderdale into Miami. And uh, and yeah, it's it's slightly surreal. Like it's, yeah. Yeah. not quite common. Uh, like, <laughs> no, like, it, was, it was it was cool. Like it was, and but it's like oh my god, yeah. You know, like it's it's so uh, they don't get it. Like because some some Americans haven't got a passport, so they're like. So I had this one girl. She goes, "How did you even get here? <laughs> <laughs> plane? Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got a, on a plane." Um, but then there's some really cool stuff. I was able to go down to um, down to Orange County. Uh, you know, so Pacific Coast, you know, um, PCH, mm. um, and the Laguna Beach, and to, to go there and just like the coolest cars, mm. and then also like so massive car culture and massive art culture, and I happened to to, to walk into Troy Lee, who's a um, um, an American helmet painter, mm. uh, who who paints Ken Block's helmets. Cool. That's who Very paints. cool. Right. So yeah. I walk into the store and then I walk, and there's a Triumph bike on my on my, on my right hand side, and. Um, I'm like, this is quite nice. I said that, like, oh, good to see another Brits here. And then <laughs> the lady behind the counter was like, so am I. I was like, pardon? I was like, where, 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 where are you from? She, she's from Dudley. <laughs> really? <laughs> of all the places to go Of from, all the yeah. places, <laughs> yeah. This, yeah. this random shop that I found off two streets off Pacific Coast Highway mm. is Troy Lee's shop, and the girl behind the counter is, uh, is is you know from Dudley. That's but nice. Obviously, she's been there fifteen years, so her accent is all like yeah. 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 The more <laughs> I talk, yeah. the, more, the more I talk to her, the more her accent comes back. And um, and then the other girl in the store, she goes, "You're pop and colour." And I'm like, "What? How? I was like, "How did you even know?" Yeah. Power so, of the and internet. She, and she's like, yeah. "I follow you on Instagram." Yeah. And I was like, "It's crazy." It's just this, 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 but that's the beauty of this industry. It's like it. From, I think from an outsider point of view, it looks it looks big, mm. but actually when it's, you're in it and yes, work within yeah. it, and I have done for eight years mm. and people have moved about within the industry, yes. yeah. you tend to know faces and people from different places and, mm. and whatever. But that's 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 what's awesome about it. Yeah, yeah. When, whether I do US or Dubai or wherever, there's there's people. Yeah, there's a lot of expats in Dubai that. I That's can, cool. yeah, I know as well, which, which is, mm. which is cool. So. so sorry to cut you off there, but we've got a question for Umesh. Um, John would like to know: Do you think that franchise dealers are overcomplicating the sales process and losing business? Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Straight, straightforward answer to which that. Which is yes. good for you. Yeah. You know, I think, I say, very complicated. You know, there's a simple process. Why complicated? Mm. They must complicate it for a reason, though. Upsells, I guess. And uh, upsell is one of the reasons. Yeah. But I th I'm sure they can still upsell without. Been drawn out. Mm. You, you still tell the customer what you know what's available um, and upsell. Mm. But I, th I think it's just the time taken, and when the feedback, you know, what customers are telling me, it's just far too long. Yeah, speak for yourself. You know, I'm not making these up. These are stories from genuine customers who are buying cars off me. So have yeah. they been to a franchise and then changed their mind because it's taken too long and come to Some you? Some have absolutely. Right, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's good for me. I'm not complaining, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think they are uh, uh, overcomplicated. It. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, we're going to go to a break quickly now. Um, we'll be back in a couple of minutes, and we're going to have Ed Steele from Steele Dixon. They're a motoring recruitment company. So if you've got any questions for him, he's going to be talking about giving you some advice on the best way to recruit staff. But if you've got any questions, send them over, and we'll put them to him in a minute. Speak to you soon. At this year's uh, CDX 16, car dealers can expect an action-packed day. We've managed to line up some fantastic keynote speakers. People like Facebook and Twitter are going to be there to explain to dealers how to use social media to, to, to the best possible way when it comes to selling cars. We've got Google who are going to explain how the, how the search engine can work best for dealers. Um, we're also delighted to, to say that we've got Jim Holder. He's the editorial director from Haymarket behind brands like what car, auto car and piston heads and he's going to be giving some fantastic insight into what car buyers want these days. Some of the key workshops of CDX16 will be covering topics such as personnel, training and development, how to find the right talent, how to retain that talent and how to look at things like your website, marketing and of course the all important how to increase sales. Suppliers really need to be at CDX. It has be rapidly become the event for the motor trade. Last year we had 1,500 dealers turn up. This year we're aiming for 2,000. All of our workshops are hosted by experts in their field. 
So you're going to come away and you're going to have learnt something from those workshops that you can implement and put into place in your business the very next day. This year for CDS 16 we're not resting on our laurels, we are making it bigger and better than ever before. And that's not only the expo is going to be larger, we've got an additional hall, but we're also going to be focusing more on the workshops. The workshops are where dealers can, can learn something new. We've got 12 fantastic topics, um, they range from recruitment to personnel to, to making the most out of online sales. Um, and it's the place where dealers can, can really pick up some hints and tips to better their business and make that day out of the office really pay for itself. So if they haven't got a place at this year's CDX, they need to hurry up because places are selling out very, very quickly indeed. It's very easy to get more information about CDX 16. Um, they can simply click on a link that's probably going to be uh, playing underneath my face. They can call uh, the office on 02392 522 434 or tweet us. Um, I'm at Car Dealer Ed. The magazine's at Car Dealer Mag. We're out there. We're listening to what you've got to say. And if you need any help uh, in, in, in booking a place and booking a ticket, then get in touch with, one, with myself or any one of the team here. Hello, welcome back to Trade Plates Live. I'm joined on the sofa, I've got Umesh Samani and I've got Ian Cook from Pop Van Colour. But on the TV, your spot, I've now got Ed Steele from Steele and Dixon. Uh, they are a motoring recruitment company. I want to say hello. Hello. So, Ed, can you explain a little bit about um, what's special about your business and what you do? We are a motor industry specific recruitment company. Hmm. Um, and we're founded by my grandfather in 1961. Uh, my father joined in 1970, I joined in 2005, and my sister joined in 2012, I believe. And um, we've always specialised in, in the automotive industry, um, both in the UK and overseas. Uh, so we um, should have a, a pretty rounded opinion on the <laughs> industry. Right. So what's the um, biggest problem that you find when people are trying to recruit sales executives or managers? Um, I hope we've got long enough. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I've given some thought to that question and um, there are so many different answers. Uh, it's where to start. I think uh, some people do it incredibly well. That should not be overlooked. Right. Um, but I think uh, it's, a, it's something that comes up in, in a lot of the questions that you've posed, which is um, how people go about the recruitment process whether or not they see that as, uh, as an enjoyable experience and something to be um, engaged with positively or, or whether they see it as a bugbear and, and, a, and, a, and a hassle, um, which it can often be, I think, um, depends in which way you go about it. Um, but, but giving it time and investing in it properly, just like anything, uh, it will be an enjoyable experience and should produce good results. What are people doing when they're doing it right then? Um, I think that um, if you're doing it directly and not using a recruitment company uh, and going to, to market to find people yourself, it's, it's about how you um, engage with people. I mean, we all say that first impressions count. Mm. Well, um, the same is true of, of when you first go out and try and find an employee. Uh, and I think it's um, something that easily is overlooked when engaging a recruitment company, you think, oh, well, they'll do it for us. We just need to ring them. Well, we are, in fact, and any recruitment company is an, is an extension of the company that they're working for. Mm. So really good first impressions. I think um, you know, a, a recruitment phone, company phoning you up and looking disorganized and not having much information about the job and not really knowing, uh, answer, being able to answer any of your questions as a candidate would be a bit disappointing and probably rather frustrating. <laughs> Um, you know, I wouldn't be impressed myself, so uh, I would probably say thanks very much and, uh, you know, I'm not interested. So, uh, and then the company needs to really engage in that, so put together a job spec and, and very simple things that can often be seen as uh, too, too sort of, too much time to invest because there's a hole to fill. Mm. Um, so that seems like quite, from what you're saying, quite a simple thing, just to talk a little bit more to your recruitment company. Yeah. Would be like the key bits of information that you 
if you were going to advise someone on how to hire someone well, what information do you guys need? Um, I mean, it often is the case we're working with clients that we've worked with for, for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we, we've often uh, maybe even had that job before. So we, we already know quite a bit of information about the service department, how many technicians it has, what's its labor sales for, for that year and uh, what systems they're on and so on and so forth. So thankfully, we're in quite a unique position where we can um, operate without as much information as maybe somebody who is starting out in recruitment would need. Right. Um, but actually knowing, but, but things change on a month by month basis, on a day by day basis. Mm. So in fact, uh, I, I spent uh, three days touring a client's business recently, going to every dealership, uh, meeting pretty much everybody in the dealership to really get to know who's there, how it feels, um, what, what the staff are like, uh, and, and uh, even where the canteen is and, and where people make cups of tea. Um, I think spending time to really um, uh, uh, give information about your business mm. is so important. So how many technicians you got and, and what the setup is of the workshop. and. You know, organograms are not something uh, I tend to be offered. Um, you know, I have to scribble it down on a piece of paper and and um, and piece it together. Mm. Uh, but but offering up more statistics and numbers is also really important. Um, uh, performance, how how the dealership's doing. Um, I mean, uh, uh, the more information, the the easier it is to recruit. Does that make it easier for you to then? have an applicant in and you can say that person will work in the business or it won't? In, certainly in theory, yeah. I mean, um, it, 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 we've been having a long discussion about this recently, about the difference between sales, after sales, um, management, accountants, um, parts, uh, the various different um, sectors within a dealership. And um, it has to be said that um, when you're recruiting on, on personality, it's much more complicated than when you're recruiting on specific skill sets. And, and sales tends to be led by personality. You, you, you know, there, there are less qualifications you need um, uh, that are specific to being a salesperson. There, there, there are lots you can get, but uh, you, know, you don't need to be an ACCA qualified accountant, you, you know, but you do need to be qualified to be an accountant through certain processes. Uh, and that's much harder when you're recruiting on personality. So it may be all well and good having a load of information which says you've got X amount of sales execs, do F&I penetration at this rate, do um, uh, all the various different things you might need to know about a sales manager, uh, but actually ultimately it will come down to personality and, and that's very hard for a recruitment company to predict. You can, you can get it there or thereabouts, but certainly not accurately without the client's input. Mm. Are there any mistakes people are making then that you would advise against? Um, I think it's a difficult question to answer because um, people um, do make mistakes, but I think the recruitment process is uh, one that you are very likely to make mistakes in because you're, you're, you're picking people and only time will tell if you've got that right. Mm. I think it's inevitable that you will make mistakes in doing that. Uh, that probably has to be accounted for in, in some capacity. Um, one would hope that engaging somebody such as Steele Dixon would improve your chances of, um, of not making mistakes mm. because we're here doing this every day. Uh, uh, dealers are car dealers, not recruitment companies. Mm. Um, although uh, everybody has to do recruitment, so uh, although that doesn't make everybody an expert. I suppose it's fair to say. I guess what most people are looking for is someone that's going to stick around. So what's the best way to hire someone like that and what steps can you take after the recruitment process to make sure that you get someone that stays for the long haul, I guess? Um, yeah, it's another really interesting point about, uh, I, I see I've always said that a recruitment company should never be blamed for retention. Mm because the recruitment company is here to, I mean, I see Steel Dixon as a finding service. We find people, we can't make them stay. That's up to the company. Uh, and that's about good management, um, investing in management training. Uh, you know, I don't know how, how, you know, 
how much is done on that and there are certainly new qualifications that are out there in the industry that you can um, that you can get which which such as the um, uh, the new the ATT is it for technicians uh, or ATA uh, and I think there's now a management uh, qualification that's that's very similar um, you know, that's crucial uh, because poor management is often the reason why people are phoning us um, and I think salaries is obviously a massive uh, important point, money talks, and um, I think in, in years previous um, it's been unfashionable to say you're motivated by money, well uh, I think that's, that's not true. In a, in a recent survey I read preparing for this discussion, um, it, it seems to be something like 60% of people's reasons for staying or going is, is the wrong money. Right. <laughs> the right money. Question for, you, uh, uh, for Ed, sorry. Um, Obviously, when you look at people's CVs uh, for recruitment, do you mm -hmm. have to look at the on social media as well, Facebook or Twitter or whatever, just to see the people and just find a bit of background information on them? Just curious. Yeah, funnily enough, and that, that was going to be, I think, um, one of Rebecca's questions about how oh, recruitment <laughs> changed. <laughs> well, how recruitment changed. And you know, when Steel Dixon first started, we sent CVs by Telegram. Um, you know, really? <laughs> now you can look people up on Facebook and see what they're like without ever having met them. Um, you know, and it is uh, astonishing how um, how that's changed. And, but uh, probably that's overlooked uh, mm. in many hires. You know, not going on social media, not looking at people's activity, um, and you know, if, seeing if that gives you an indication. I'm not suggesting everyone should become a stalker, but uh, there's a certain amount of due diligence there that's probably uh, no harm in doing. Mm. Uh, people's profiles are probably often locked, so you won't be able to see. But you know, it's certainly something you should do. I guess for it's a slightly different area, car dealers, where you might look at someone's profile and see that they're a big party animal, but actually being able to interact with people might be more of a tick as long as it's not too far that way into the reckless side. But do you ever see people and you think, you're obviously a social person, you can obviously get along with people, you'd be good for a dealership? Um, or should people not be posting stuff like that or have their stuff all hidden? I mean, uh, no, I don't see why you should be denying who you are if yeah. that's who you are um, and you're doing a good job and you've got a good customer service record, then uh, there's, there's no harm in that. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a careful line to tread there uh, mm. and, and uh, having a, um, uh, an open access on Facebook that, that shows that you're spending most of your time not thinking about work may not be what a future employer wants to see. So is there anything else about recruitment that's changing or have you seen it change over the past few years? Um, again, we, it's a, a sort of constant discussion in our office about uh, a CV and you know, that's never changed in, in the 54 years we've been operating. We still send CVs and um, you know, no one has yet come up with a better alternative. Uh, I have seen a few YouTube CVs which you know, I don't think they're, they're quite catching on yet, but um, you know, that, that one to watch maybe. Mm. Uh, and I think actually fun the, the fundamental process of recruitment hasn't changed at all. It's still about uh, in, engaging a recruitment company or going direct to market, interviewing people and, um, and making a decision. Uh, that, that hasn't changed. How we make that decision and the tools that are there to find people is the certainly changed the internet, obviously, uh, being an enormous part of that. Um, LinkedIn, you know, everybody's got access to a, a people database now, which used to be one of our unique selling points. Uh, I don't think we can quite claim that, nor can any other yeah. group. <laughs> uh, although someone did say to me what is maybe more relevant now is how many people follow you, rather than how many people you have access to, which mm. may show a, an engagement the other way that, 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 that is important. Right. So everyone's going to look at my followers now, and I'm, I'm you know, hoping <laughs> precinct by the minute. <laughs> I, you were. I don't know if you guys have got any other questions for Ed. Some pressure on. Can't think of anything else on that. Okay. Yeah. No, that's cool. um, yeah, I don't think another, yeah, another artist can paint with cars yet. So you've got the unique. Yeah, I've got that unique. <laughs> yeah. if, you do, if you do find somebody else pitching that, uh, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're going to say goodbye to you now, Ed. Thank you so much for joining us. Right. It's really interesting. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Um, so, we've had a question from Ivan, who I assume is Ivan Hamilcars. I guess so. <laughs> saying, does Umesh feel that it's getting harder for the smaller dealer to compete against the big franchise dealers? 
all serious face though. It's very serious face. No, uh, at the end of that, I'm not trying to compete uh, with the big with the big franchise dealers. I think mm. small dealers are small dealers. You know, we're not trying to. We're in a different category to the franchise dealers. Mm. They do business in a different way to the small independents. Yeah. Um, so in in that sense, I think at the end of the day, all that is we're all competing for the business, but we're in different marketplaces. Mm. So. Yeah, it's not, it's not a direct competition, really. Um, I don't know if that answers about Ivan's. having a yeah. yeah, hopefully. Yes, hopefully so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, Edmund has says hello from Cork. Hello, Edmund. Uh, one of the questions we've had is, I want to hear about your cars. What you've got. The, one of the unique parts of your business is that you actually print onto cars, also. Yeah. So uh, no, over the years, with a number of car wraps as mm. well. So. Uh, initially, it was a Chevrolet Spark, which was a, an express car from Chevy when they were, when they were in the UK. Mm. Um, so we had the Spark, uh, the Spart, which was because each of the, the cars have got an art in their name. Yeah. So the Spark ran. We had a, it was a '59 plate, um, and we had that. I had that for four years. Mm. Um, and then I started doing test cars and you know, kind of trying out manufacturer cars, which is you know, really great to get a knowledge and you know, learn about. What the cars do, so, mm. you know, well, not just like painting them, like what actually are the cars like? Yeah, because people do ask me, and they, they have to say, What have you driven, whatever. And and you know, prior to that, I was about to go, well, I've got, got a little Chevrolet, it's all right, it yeah. gives me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but now I I, I own a I co own a, a Morgan three wheeler, which is my yeah, my so what's because Morgan's obviously a very niche. I love brand. it. I, I lo what I love about Morgan is um, is one, it's a Midlands brand. It's you mm. know it's in the Morgan Hills. It's, you know, it's, it's a very much you know, compared to other car company factories. It's this this small building in the in the shadow of the hills. And I think for for, for a brand like that to to have still you know at Geneva this year with the with the uh, the, uh, the the three the, the electric three wheeler mm. to have such a sort of clout still and still producing handmade. Cars made out of wood and metal, and blokes bashing it in a yeah, bashing it together in a shed. <laughs> it's uh, still amazing, isn't it? Really, if you think about it, it's yeah. it's, it's phenomenal. It's yeah. a phenomenal. It's, it's brilliant to have. And uh, you know, each of the factories, a bit. Yeah, I've been around Aston Martin factory, down Bentley. Yeah, yeah, the Bentley. Yeah, you know, the, with the with the wood. You know, making you know, smelling that wood being created and and whatnot is 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 an amazing thing. But yeah, I think Mark, particularly with Morgan, yeah, said, I just really like this this kind of small little company creating very much bespoke one-off you know, each of those cars is unique mm. much like an artwork you know mm. that's that's what I really enjoy about it is that you can customize and change and upgrade and you yeah. can go back and change you know add bits and upgrade bits and uh, and also it's such a fun thing to, to own as well like it's not it's not like an R you know an RS6 or anything like that which is you know like you know Subarus and whatever which have this top end power mm. it's more about that kind of the you know, the lower speeds, but having you know, but fun at fun. those speeds, and also there's, there's so much you, you experience so much in that car as well, like because you know, you're so small and mm. you, yeah, you're up against yeah, everything's bigger than you when you're driving a three wheeler, um, <laughs> and it's kind of that yeah, you do it's just that fun element mm. of which are you know it's, you don't get in a lot of cars yeah it's just this real kind of adventure of of wherever you're going. Mm. Uh, Nostalgia, isn't it really? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, very much so. And uh, having driven it from from Melbourne to Geneva and back uh, last year, mm. wow. I mean that was quite a yeah, you know, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, as an adventure that was pretty cool. And going via mm. you know, uh, rain circuit and um, and doing it as a, this road trip was really exciting. So what are you? You're obviously quite ingrained in the automotive industry. Is there anything you're really excited about at the moment that's coming up or? Yeah, I mean, I think I think recently, I mean, the what was I did for for Goodyear tires? I I did a, a giant artwork which was painted solely with their tires, and that had a really good social kind of uh, push on it as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was done in a in a film in a hangar down in London. Um, filmed it, and then we released it recently. Um, and as always, yeah, what what is now from April onwards is the event season. So I really, yeah, I was down at the um, at the WEC for the World Endurance at Silverstone. Mm. Uh, at the weekend, and, and it's such a buzz about it. Like the people, you know, like, a bit like being a dealership where you meet people and you yes. see the same people. Last year, you, you kind of like, you're catching up with people because they'll come and see you, chat for a bit, and then they'll see you the four weekends okay, time. Just through. Yes. And it's yeah. and it, and that's what, and as well as social media. You know, they, they, not only do you meet them at the event, but you can 
you know, they can follow what you're doing online and seeing what they're doing. And often, yeah, they'll they'll they'll, they'll say, "Oh, well, what you been? Oh, see, so you, see, so being here, see, so being there," and that's and that's really exciting. That's what that's what I love. So we've got a um, question for you. In when <laughs> when will you do a full size piece with real cars as the paintbrushes? Is that it's already been done. done. I was going to say, so I'm pretty sure you've done that. I am a Guinness World Record holder. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, not me. Nissan are, but I am. <laughs> no, I you, I, I, you, you, you got a part in there. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, had it yeah. not been for yes. me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I've done it. So, uh, so last year we got the Guinness World Record for the world's largest glow-in-the-dark mm. painting. Um, which was done in it's very very I niche. Mean, very niche. Very <laughs> niche. <laughs> I know. It's, I know. It's not kind of like something that just rolls off your tongue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we painted with a Nissan Leaf, um, a two hundred and seven square meter sized wow. artwork, which is when, when it when it it's takes a really hard to compromise. Yeah, it's very size. difficult to, to to go how big day is that. Yeah. It took up half a hangar, wow. like oh, a, 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 yes. a you know an aircraft hangar yeah. in in in, in Basingstoke. Just that's amazing. Um, but yeah, we did that. So we, what? So we had the Nissan, the Nissan fluoresced the artwork glue under UV light. Mm. So you had these kind of different things going on with the artwork. But look, there's an impress. There's, there's a cool video online mm. um, of it being done. Um, you yeah, know, with this, this leaf painting a, a, a portrait of a leaf. <laughs> yeah, an artwork of a leaf. Yeah. Um, and that was done, yeah. That and I painted with Jolly and Palmer as well a couple of years ago for Com Royals. We did a piece with it when he was in F two. Right. At Brands Hatch, we did mm. painting that with a car as well. Um, but yeah, so I mean, there's there's always like these, pro, you know, kind of mm. bigger projects and whatever. I suppose um, next thing is probably a truck. Well, oh, the one, well, when we when we did the Com <laughs> one, we painted, with, we painted with a truck. One right. Of, it, was, okay. it was an F two. It was a, a bike and F two car. And a truck, right? Wow. And um, which is, it was, yeah, because I get, I happen to have these like bizarre. I normally can't say, but like a stunt. Mm. And they go right. What's this is what this is what the end result. This is what we want the end result as. Mm. How do we do it? Yeah. Or like you know, how do we go? You know, I kind of go right. We need to do that or that or that. And mm. So you know, kind of planning it, and then and obviously creating it is the. Is the, is the key thing, mm. um, whether it's a video piece or a live piece or, or whatever. Something I want to pick up on you saying about seeing people every time the season comes around, you see them again. Yeah. You must have a similar thing with people that come back like in the next year. You might not have seen them for a long time, and then I do. A lot of my. Do you always remember them? Ninety uh, percent of the time, no. I do. Okay. Yes, and that <laughs> that goes a long way. Mm. It, it's recognition. Um, certainly, you know, face wise, 80 percent of the names as well. Right. Uh, which I think freaks some of the people out really because they say, how do you remember me? You know, and they don't expect mm. to be remembered. But it must be quite a personal thing for them or for you, them in the car. Are they associated? Uh, yeah, I mean, very, very sad, but many, many years ago, I used to remember people by registration numbers and the old fashioned number plates. <laughs> yeah, literally, I would look at a car, registration number, and I'd have a name associated with that. Mm. But when the number plate started sort of changing, 2001, whatever it was, more difficult with with the, with the numbers, but yeah, it, it it is just recognition. Do people tell you why they've come back to you again to buy a car, or do you ask them? Because I would. I suppose they tell me. Yeah. Uh, straightforward, honest service. Look after them. Good mm. service. Good cars. Yeah. Just all back to basics. N nothing. Uh, is that the most important thing? That good car, they'll always come back because they can trust you. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you sell them a good car, they're going to come back because it's been hassle free. Mm. And you've, plus, you've made the process easy for them to buy as well. So what's the best piece of advice you would give other dealers that some of them are saying they're having a hard time at the moment? I think the best advice I'd give to anybody, I think, in general in business is treat others how you like to be treated. Mm. It's simple rule as that, you know, I always put myself in the customer's shoes. You know, I'm not saying all my cars are perfect. I do have the odd one or two which has an issue. And I think, right, how would I like to be treated? Mm. And that's how I treat my customers. Yeah, and sometimes you have to throw the money out of the window and say, it doesn't matter if it's cost me, you know, a few hundred quid or whatever look after the customer and they've come back or recommended this to me. I think it's just as simple as that really. Perfect. Okay, thank you guys for joining us. We've now come to the end of our time. But if you want have any more questions for these guys, you can find Umesh, you are at Specialist Cars 1. That's it, yep. Ian, you are at Pop Band Colour, yeah. And I'm sure if you tweet them over any questions, they'll be happy to pick up. Make sure you follow them as well. And follow Trade Plates TV. We'll be tweeting a picture of the finished piece of artwork later, so make sure you check it out. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you, Ian, for letting us Pleasure. take over your entire space. We've actually just completely taken over his shop, and it's been amazing. Um, we are going to be back 
on the 3rd of May. We're going to have Nigel McMinn from Lookers and Ross Quirk from Quirk's Car Company joining us and Logistics will be back. So tune in then, we'll be posting more stuff nearer to the time. Thank you, bye.